Well, after that bit about school uniforms and playing at being the Sun News Bay for a minute, although I do still think it's a serious issue, we'll go straight on to this. I said this morning we'd look at a book called by Henry Mayer about London Labour of the Poor. However, on my trips earlier, I went to my university's library to see that librarian who's been assigned to me for this year so she could show me around the place and sort of give me a tour and uh, um, instruct me on how to get into areas that are not for students below my level and are only for staff and doctoral students. In any case, we I found this nice book in the Waterstones nearby. I could make you read the look at the books I took out from the university library, but I really don't think you're going to be thrilled to look at religion and the decline of magic or medieval literature with large sections in Middle English. But this particular book is by Oscar Jensen, and it's about vagabonds and people at the bottom end of society in London in the 19th century. The opening was quite interesting. Let me get to it. Saturday, the 26th of March, 1859, and David Wire, Lord Mayor of London, is presiding over a petty session, ready to dispense justice. These court appearances are not easy for him. He is pushing 60, double chin and far from well. Still, the case before him promises to be a swift one. Mary Ann Donovan, aged 18, and, as is so often the case, Irish is charged with attempting to school. Combs on Cornhill. This then develops into a narrative about the judge being mightily offended about a young woman who has little other means of income selling a combs. The young woman points out that basically it's better than her going on the game. And it goes back and forth till Miss Donovan responds, Then, sir, tell me how, says Donovan, I can't take a shop. And if I sell in the streets, you'll say I'm liable to 40 shillings fine or a month in prison. If I beg, you'll beg, you'll give me three months. Perhaps if I steal, I don't know what will become of me. So tell me if you can, what the poor girl will do. But why had heard enough from the this Irish girl? Any of all events, you must keep out of the city, and you have been here in court before. I must send you to prison for 14 days. <laughs> this then developed into a, a minor press scandal, with the press taking... Donovan's side to some extent and money being collected for her. However, in the end, it, the court refused to release this to her. He, and she disappears out of the, the narrative of history at this point. Who knows what became of her? Did she die young? It's quite possible. She had no other income and a low education. So she didn't have many skills to offer except, well, one skill we won't go into. This shows the kind of call callous complacency of the judiciary of this era basically the poor were disposable he was unable to understand the judge here in this story that the young girl really did not have any other way perhaps to make a living she was forced to do what she could the absolute lack of empathy is repeated again and again in this book and this kind of lack of empathy and class divide is part of Henry May's work which we'll turn to now one of the things Mayhew spends a great deal of time on in his book is the divide within sections of the poor. He doesn't just have a homogenous poor, there's a hierarchy of the poor. And the, he has them battling it out, trying to undersell staff, battling for whatever small pecuniary advantage they can get over each, them, each other. I'm going to read this some of this section now. I have therefore, sorry, I have before alluded to the underselling of the Jew by, by the Irish boy in the street orange trade. But the characteristics of the change are all so peculiar that a further notice is necessary. It is curious to observe that the most assiduous and hitherto the most successful of street traders was supplanted not by a more persevering, a more skilling body of street, street sellers, but simply by a more starving body. Some few years since poor Irish people, and chiefly those connected with the culture of the land, came over to this country in great numbers, actuated either by vague hopes of bettering themselves by immigration, or working on the railways, or else influenced by the restlessness common to an impoverished people. These men, when unable to attain employment without scruple, became street sellers. Not only did the adults resort to street traffic, generally in its simplest forms such as hawking fruits, but the children by whom they were accompanied from Ireland in great numbers were put into this trade, 
And if two or three children earn two pennies a day each and their parents five or six pennies each, or even four pence, the substance of the family was better than they could obtain in the midst of the miseries of the southern and western part of the sister isle. An Irish boy of 14, having to support himself by street trade, as was often the case, owing to the death of parents and to diverse casualties, would understell the Jew boy similarly circumstanced. The Irish boy could live harder than the Jew, often in his own country, subsisted on stolen turnip a day. He could lodge harder, lodge for one penny a night in any noisome den, or sleep in the open air, which is seldom done by the Jew boy. He could dispense with the use of shoes and stockings, a dispension and Expansion at which his rival in trade revolted. He drank only water. If he took it, tea or coffee, it was as a meal and not merely as a beverage. To crown the whole, the city bred Jew boy required some evening application. The penny or two penny concert, or a game of draughts or dominoes. But this is the Irish boy, country bred, never thought of. For his sole luxury was a deep sleep. Here we have a picture in miniature of two classes of people rubbing off each other in competition with uh, cultural gaps between them that are liable to spark misunderstanding and tension, as they did. It was still there to some extent, even when I was young. There was a cultural gap, even though the cultures had mutated and changed quite a lot. However, that's by and by the point. What's more important the Irish boy and the Jew boy in this example are precursors to the ethnic strife we see in our own day and precursors because of the fact that they need to make a living somehow not because they're inherently bad or wicked the Jew boy here and the Irish boy are neither wicked people they somehow have to make a living it is giving in to simplistic statements about society to suggest that people are just wicked or somehow conditioned by the culture as wicked in us. This is why I find the polarization that we see on both the internet and in our society so worrying. It's like we're almost going backwards in time and that there's an anomaly in our societies that are breaking down any sense of society or, or acting together as a group. It's depressing to watch. And I don't think anything is gained by making up generalised rules about white people, black people, Asian people, or any other group. I'd recommend Henry Mayhew. He has a lot to read about this say about this period, which if you read is well worth perusing. And this book, Bag of Bonds, I'll be reading the rest of it and coming back to it, I think. It's frankly irrelevant to how society is... Again, turning today.